Jagarita stano bahish pragya saptanga ek ona vingshatin mukaha stula bhug vaishvanara pratama padaha. The first quarter is Vaishvanara, whose sphere of action is Jagra, the waking state, whose consciousness relates to external things, who is possessed of seven limbs and nineteen mouths, and who enjoys gross things. Shankaracharya's Tika continues with an objection. The gross cosmic world, as constituting Virat, is the first quarter. The subtle cosmic world, as constituting Hiranyagarbha, is the second quarter. The cosmic world in its causal state of ignorance, as constituting the unmanifested, is the third quarter. That again, when it is freed from states of cause and effect, and exists merely as the substratum of all, as existence, knowledge, bliss, is the fourth quarter. Then, how is it that heaven and the rest are presented as the head, etc.? Answer. That is nothing incongruous, inasmuch as the intention is to show that the entire phenomenal universe and the world of gods, together with this gross cosmic self, contribute to the constitution of the four parts. If the presentation is made in this way, non-duality stands established on the removal of the entire phenomenal world. The self existing in all beings is realized as one, and all beings are seen as existing in the self. Thus alone will stand affirmed the meaning of the Vedic text, he who sees all beings in the very self, and the self in all beings. Otherwise, the indwelling self, as circumscribed by one's own body, will alone be perceived, as it is by the Sankhyas and others. And in that case the specific statement made by the Upanishad that it is non-dual will have no distinctiveness, for there will be no difference from the philosophy of the Sankhyas and others. But as a matter of fact, it is desirable to find all the Upanishads in accord in propounding the unity of all the selves. Therefore, it is but reasonable that, having in view the identity of the self as Vishva in the individual physical context, with the self as Virat, Vaishvanara, in the divine context, the former should be mentioned as possessed of seven limbs, comprising such physical constituents as heaven, etc. This identity of Vishvanara with Virat is suggestive of the unity of Taijasa, dream consciousness, with Hiranyagarbha, and Pragna, deep sleep, with the unmanifested. And this has been stated in the Madhu Brahmana of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad 2.5.1. The same with the shining immortal being who is in this earth, and the shining immortal corporeal being in the body. These four are but this self, etc. As for the unity of the self in Sushupti, Pragna, and the unmanifested. It is a patent fact because of the absence of distinctions. Such being the case, it will become proved that non-duality follows on the dissipation of all duality. Namaste. <laughs> so this is the first instance of an objection where Shankaracharya takes the arguments of the opponents, in this case the Sankhyas, who say that everything, including consciousness, is a material element, and each one has its own reservoir in the Mahatattva, or the cosmic, unmanifested cosmic elements at the beginning of creation. But, of course, we disagree with that, 
we say that Brahman is the foundation and that Aum represents that Brahman and that Aum is equal to, absolutely equivalent to, everything that can be perceived. And Shankara, in an earlier tika, mentioned that this is because if we accept the equivalency of Aum with everything perceivable, then to remove all of them is only going to take a single effort. So what is he talking about here? He's talking about deep samadhi. To attain that state beyond perception, beyond good and bad, vice and virtue, right and wrong, you know, all dualities. Uh, if you make these things equivalent, then with one effort you can remove both sides of the equivalency, both sides of the equal sign. So he's doing something similar here. He's going to take the four quarters, the Jagrat consciousness, Swapna consciousness, Sushupti, and Turiya, and equate them with different aggregates of the cosmic creation. For example, he introduces the term Vaishvanara. Now, Vaishvanara is not a common term in later Puranic Sanskrit, but it's very well known in Vedic and Upanishadic, I should say, Upanishadic Sanskrit. And what it means is really the aggregate or the combination of all gross senses and sense objects, as we described last time. So Vaishvanara then uh, is referenced or confirmed by a quote from the Brihadaranyakopanishad. And this quote is the conclusion, really, of a long discussion, several sections long, about Vaishvanara in that Upanishad. And basically, the gist of the story is that Vishvamrita is asking a bunch of brahmanas how they conceive of or how they meditate on Vaishvanara. And each of them gives a different answer. One says, I meditate on the feet. Another one says, I meditate on the head, the arms, the heart, and so on. So many different views. And then finally, Vishvamrita says, no, that you're all just looking at a part of the picture. And to really get what Vaishvanara is, you have to look at the whole picture. That Vaishvanara is all the gross senses and their objects in one being, in one thing. Huh? It could be a conceptual thing or it could be an actual being that we could have a relationship with. And as I mentioned in the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is shown this Vishvamurti, this universal form by Krishna. And in that, he is eating all of the souls that have to die in the battle of Kurukshetra. So this is the eater. Vaishvanara is known as the eater. He has 19 mouths, so he must be very hungry. <laughs> and of course, these 19 mouths are compared to all the different senses. So including the mind, the intelligence, the ego, and the mind stuff. There are these 19 sense inputs that are going all the time, hungry for content. And when we're awake, of course, we get it through the senses. But when we're asleep, then we get it through dreams. And so the next uh, shloka will deal with that. But for right now, we have to make clear, what is the Vaishvanara? And what is the meditation on Vaishvanara? And last time we used the example of water. 
how the water all over the world collects in rivers and then gradually flows down to the ocean. And the ocean is the aggregate. The ocean is the collective. The ocean is the cause of the water in the streams because as the ocean evaporates, it forms clouds, they go and rain on the hills and the water flows down again. And this is the water cycle. So in the same way, all the gross sense objects and the senses that access them combine together as an aggregate. This is Vaishvanara. Vishva means everything, all pervading. And Nara means man, Vaishvanara. So this means this is the, all the human sense and sense objects collected in one place from all over the universe, just like the ocean is the reservoir of water on the earth planet. Vaishvanara is the reservoir of all these gross senses and their objects and the perceptions thereof. So, what does that mean for our meditation? Well, it means that the Jagrat consciousness is universal in scope. It's similar to an element, but it's not really an element because it's a conditioned form of Brahman. It's Brahman covered by a particular upadi. And the upadi in this case is, of course, the gross bodily senses. And the senses are derived from their objects. They are light, color and form for sight, tone, pitch, and loudness for hearing, and so on for a smell, taste, touch, and the various sensations of the mind. All of these are combined together in an aggregate, and that is Vaishvanara. So because Vaishvanara is uh, in relationship with these external senses and sense objects. It is called the gross enjoyer. He's the gross enjoyer. And how come all of these things, the head and the arms and the legs and the feet, are all actually one thing? Is because they all have means. Means, in other words, sense organs connected with them. So the difference between, for example, Vaishvanara and Prajna, the next one, the uh, Svapna consciousness, is that Svapna has no means. Svapna has no sense uh, or sense objects. So uh, it's all about impressions only, mental impressions. It's not about actual physical sense experiences. So that's the main difference between the two. And of course, he's going to be going deeper and deeper into this, right? Uh, following the Upanishad. And then we're going to get, once we cover the Turiya, the final one in the four stages of consciousness, then we're going to go into the, the Karika. And the Karika is going to make this all make sense according to reason and logic. And this is the wonderful thing about this Upanishad and Karika, that yes, they do make reference to the Vedas and Upanishads for confirmation, but the basic truths that they express are something that anyone can verify by observing their own being. Huh? Anyone can verify, oh yes, I have a layer of consciousness that is connected to the senses and sense objects. I have a different layer that's connected with the impressions thereof, and so on. And as we get through all of these things, you will have all the tools and information necessary to identify them in yourself, leading to mastery of consciousness, which is right next door to complete enlightenment. Aum Tatsat.
ओम शक्ति ही ओम ओम नमः शिवाय